So let's talk about how to not reveal a password on the command line. Um, this affects more platform, uh, certain platforms more than others. This is the kind of scenario that we're trying to guard against. I log on on a window and I run SQL plus Scott Tiger at pluggable database number one. Someone who's also logged onto that machine in another window or another terminal, etc., but they're logged onto the same server, has done a process listing gripping for SQL plus and sitting there right there on the command line in the arguments is that username and password. And obviously that's a bit of a drama. This is a slightly artificial demonstration. Right? And the reason for that is this is a Linux box. And you actually don't see this on Linux. I just don't have access to some other boxes to, to, to the demo for you. But I've concocted this, I actually did some graphical cut and paste, but you, this is exactly the behavior you'll see on some Unixes. So it's not all platforms. Generally, it's most Unixes, so IIX, Solaris, etc. you'll see this, uh, not Linux. And on Windows, you'll see it on Windows as well. Now, you might be thinking, where do I see the list of, of tasks in, in Windows? Because if I just bring up, say, Task Manager, Normally I don't see that information, but if I'm on the command prompt, I do something like task list with the uh, verbose flag, or you're using some of the freeware tools like uh, sys from the systemternals.com, et cetera, you can actually dig into all the various bits and pieces inside each process or each thread running on Windows, and you can actually see those username and password details. So they're things that you want to you know, obviously guard against, especially if people have access to your server uh, for, for other reasons, and you'd rather not yield out any Oracle information to them. Now, what are some of the quick workarounds that we can do to um, handle this without going into too much complexity? The first one is taking advantage of SQL plus slash no log. And that makes a reasonable amount of sense. That is, as I can see, the stuff in blue there is what's going to appear on the password list, also on the process listing. And so as a result, no one's going to be able to see the passwords. The downside, of course, here is I've now got to go and put the username and password into all of my connection, my actual scripts. Now, that probably won't work in most environments because most places nowadays, the developers will be writing scripts and they'll be checking them into source code control and passing them on to an administrator. Or they might be passing them on to an automated tool. It doesn't really matter, but they probably won't be hard coding usernames and passwords in them because they won't know what the username and password is in other more secure environments. So while that's a workaround, it's not generally going to be something that's going to work that well, I think, in a genuine application development environment. The second one is using some piping. Um, and this works in Windows as well as Unix. And that is, if you know the password and it's stored in, say, an environment variable or, or somewhere else or a secure file, you can echo the password and pipe it through into SQL Plus, just passing in the username. You can actually echo the username and the password just with a normal slash into the whole thing. Doesn't really matter. Interesting in Windows, when you do it this way, the moment that script finishes, the entire SQL plus routine will exit, even if you don't have an exit command, whereas it might not in Unix. But either way, you can pipe the password in to most of the Oracle tools. So data pump, export, import, etc. There are there's a couple that it doesn't, and I can't remember I can't remember which ones why, but the vast majority are, are gonna work okay. Now, having said that, you can do a lot better than that. Better option than having the password stored somewhere secret because you know, security by, by obfuscation, security by hiding things generally is a recipe for disaster because someone's gonna find it eventually. A better option is just not to have passwords at all. And you can do that with what we call a connection wallet. And this is something that's been around for a long time, way back sort of an Oracle 8, 9 timeframe, yet a very few people use it. And I think it's just like uber cool, very cool. So there's a little bit of setup work that goes on. Now we need to have a thing called a wallet. So the first place that we need to go is go to our sqlnet.oro file. And we have these two settings in there, sqlnet.wallet override equals true. And then we need to nominate actually where the wallet will be. It's gonna be a file on my machine and I can see there the directory is C Oracle wallet. That's where my wallet is gonna be stored. The next thing I need to do is create that wallet. And I create it with what we call the MK store command, passing in dash create dash WRL stands for wallet location. Now I'm gonna put it in C Oracle wallet. And one of the cool things is in 12.1 patched and 12.2, somewhat sadly, you run it and you get the syntax of the command is incorrect. Yet that is exactly the syntax from the documentation. 
Maybe just try run MK store to see what the parameters are. You get an invalid parameter there as well. And if you try the help command, you get syntax is incorrect as well. That's a bit silly on our part and a bit poor on our part. But it turns out that MK store requires Oracle Home to be set. So you need to set Oracle Home and then it runs fine. That's a bummer because that's not meant to be the case. It's actually logged as a bug. But you know, just so in case you're running this and you want to race off and create a connection wallet, it's a bit sad that it doesn't say Oracle Home is not set. You just get this invalid command error. It's a bit of a bummer, but that's where we are. Assuming you've set Oracle Home, this is what it looks like. I'm creating a wallet, and here we have to nominate what we call a wallet password. That's the thing you don't want to lose. That's like having an encryption key. That's the thing that lets you access this wallet to do things like put entries in it for secure connections. So wallet pass dollar isn't related to any kind of database user. Wallet pass dollar is your access to actually edit this wallet. So I've created the wallet. The next thing I'm going to do, we're going to put an entry in that wallet for a thing called secure Scott. Now what's secure Scott? We'll come to that very shortly. But here are my credentials. The username is Scott. The password is Tiger. And I'm binding that to an entry in my wallet called Secure Scott. So effectively, it's like a mapping. A thing called Secure Scott is bound to Scott and Tiger. My wallet is stored. When I run this, it's going to ask me for my wallet password because I need the wallet password every time I want to put an entry or ma manipulate an entry in the wallet, and it'll be stored away. Then in my tnsnames.ora, I need to create an entry for that tag I just created, that thing called Secure Scott. It, there's nothing in the TNS names to Aura that says this belongs to a wallet. It's simply a stock standard TNS names to Aura entry. But it says I'm connecting to localhost DB2, DB version 12, 2 in this case. But it's the name of the TNS entry that's critical here. So I've called it Secure Scott. It must align with that mapping name we used inside the wallet. So bring it all together. SQLnet.Aura tells me where the wallet is. I put some entries in that wallet, wallet and one of, the, that, one of those entries was a thing called Scott Tiger bound to a thing called Secure Scott. And then in my TNS names to Aura, I said, also there's a thing called Secure Scott that points to this particular host, this port in the normal TNS names to Aura way. With those three things in place, now when I want to connect to the database, I simply, as you can see there, do SQL plus forward slash at Secure Scott. But here's the cool thing. I can do SQL plus slash at Secure Scott it is connected as scott.tiger and obviously nowhere on the command line is the username or the password. They're locked away, tucked away nice and securely inside that wallet. What this means is probably most people relate their TNS names to Aura entries with a database. I've got one database called ABC. I'll have a TNS names to Aura entry called ABC. You need to get out of that mindset because what we have here is a TNS names to Aura entry for each particular username password combination we want to connect to the database. We end up with one wallet entry and one TNS names entry per each secure login. So that was a login for Scott Tiger, and I called it Secure Scott. If I want to have a login to the same database as say Connor, password Connor, I would create another entry in the wallet. I'd call it maybe Secure Connor or Secure is not a special word here. I could call it ABC. And then I'd have a TNS names entry mapping to that as well. So I would have lots of different TNS names to Aura entries, one for each entry in the wallet, which might equate to different usernames and passwords. But yeah, connection wallets, easy to set up once you've set Oracle Home, obviously, but really easy to set up and, and fantastic. You, all, your, all your scripts, all your logons as DBAs, et cetera, can all just be done through that now. And it's all nice and secure and locked away in a wallet. Mm -hmm.